What is up, everybody, and how's it going? I'm Alex Goldstick, and you are listening to the Spring Forward Podcast. This is episode three of season two, and as promised last episode, we're coming to you live from the Spring League 2019 in Austin, Texas. The league is entering its second week of practice right now as the players gear up for the first game day of doubleheaders on Saturday, April 6th. The games will be played at the Kelly Reeves Athletic Center in Round Rock, with the first game kicking off at 3.30 p.m. local time. The second game of the doubleheader will feature the debut of the rebranded Team South, now known as the Austin Generals. The Generals, whose name is inspired by the recent establishment of the Army's Futures Command headquarters in Austin, will play Team West at 7 p.m. Tickets are available now at thespringleague.com. Also, as announced on Twitter today, due to the news about the Alliance of American Football, the Spring League will be honoring all tickets for the San Antonio Commanders home game, which was scheduled for this Saturday. All ticket stubs, mobile tickets, and proof of purchase of tickets will be good for entry to Saturday's doubleheader in Austin. The leader of the Generals' defense will be former New York Jet Lorenzo Malden, who is today's featured guest. Malden is a graduate of the University of Louisville and is a 2015 third-round NFL draft pick. His NFL career in New York was derailed by injuries in his third season, and he's now at the Spring League to show teams he's back to full health and ready to rejoin the ranks of the NFL. Let's get to our interview with the man they call Lozo. Lorenzo Malden is an outside linebacker from Atlanta who played his college ball at Louisville. He was a third-round selection of the New York Jets in 2015 and spent three seasons with the team. He's got six and a half NFL sacks to his name and is now competing at the Spring League in Austin to reclaim his NFL dream. Lozo, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for having me. Now, this is our first interview live from Austin, so before we get into your football history, I think it's appropriate to focus on the present. Uh... I don't know if you ever got to feel like a vet during your three seasons with the Jets, but you're probably the highest profile player with the longest tenured NFL career at the Spring League right now. So how have you found your time at the Spring League so far, just about five days into your two-week experience? Um, I feel like there's a lot of great talent around. I feel like I'm getting a lot of good work when it comes to uh, my position. Um, I bounced around from uh, outside linebacker to middle linebacker to defensive end. I'm basically just you know trying to show my versatility. Um, like I said, there's a lot of great work going on, um, and I feel like uh, this film should uh, jumpstart me to getting back into the NFL. How did you find out about the Spring League and ultimately get accepted uh, and commit to play in Austin this year? Um, I actually have a uh, high school teammate that I played with in uh, in Georgia, uh, Marion Reigns. He, uh, I seen him, you know, practicing and, and, and seeing pictures on Instagram, and um, I start. He started to ask me. Uh, you know, why wasn't I doing the spring league or why wasn't I doing the other leagues or anything? I was just basically saying that I was, you know, uh, injured and a lot of people don't want to, uh, in, in, like, invest in me right now. So he's like, basically, you know, I just do what I uh, do what he did and, you know, get involved with the spring league. I got into uh, looking at uh, the spring league on the website and seeing some good numbers. So I kind of, you know, got invested into it myself and thought it was a good opportunity. So before you found out about the league, what were you doing as far as training or uh, you know trying to get scouts or GMs to notice you uh, while you were out of the league? Um, I was I had a couple of visits with uh, uh, NFL teams. Um, again, I don't know if the NFL teams were pretty much on me uh, because of my uh, my surgery that I had in 2017. Um, these guys were uh, inviting me out and uh, you know kind of turning me the other way. Um, I'm thinking possibly because I haven't played in a while. Um, but when I, uh, got into training and everything, I went with elite, uh, performance training in New Jersey. Um, those guys, I had a, uh, a personal trainer and he pretty much got me to where I needed to be. And that's all I really did over the past few times, uh, the, through the times that I was, you know, out. Now, I know I say it like a New Yorker, so apologies, but Louisville is well represented in Austin, uh, as the school with the most players in attendance. Uh, there's three U of L players on your Austin General squad, and apologies for pronunciations in advance, but P.O. Vatuve, Drew Bailey, and yourself, and then offensive lineman Mohamed Karoum and D.B. Devontre Parnell are on Team West. Um, so did you know that any of these guys would be here? No, I did not, actually. So when I saw all of the guys, um, <laughs> I saw them one at a time. Actually, I didn't see them all in bunches, but 
saw him one at a time and it was like a oh it was a reaction that you know it's like dang i haven't seen you in a while type reaction and um i got a chance to play with two other guys uh po and trey um uh i had drew bailey as a as his um he i had him on his visit (laughs) so he i was his host for his Mm -hmm. visit and uh I didn't get a chance to play with Muhammad. Muhammad played years before I got there. So now let's go back to the beginning of your football story, uh, or even your story in general. You know, it's well reported that you had a bit of a disjointed childhood, uh, beginning in Sacramento, California, and leading you to finish high school in Atlanta. Um, you spent time in 16 foster homes between birth and high school. And I know there's no amount of time that can do justice to what you went through growing up, but can you fill in the information between those two points for us uh, with what you're comfortable sharing about the struggles you and your siblings went through? Um, So it's five of us. Um, We were all pretty much raised by a single mother. Um, My mother uh, did illegal things such as selling drugs and everything and uh, just for us to get by. Um, We just, we just, did what we could to get by as as siblings and then you know the times where uh she would get locked up she got locked up multiple times we were in and out of foster care um since i was two um i moved in with my grandmother when i was two and then she couldn't take care of us all so she uh you know we were all put back into foster care um after we got back with my mom but again she constantly went back and forth so uh they just kept her for a while and um they just we bounced around some homes didn't work some homes did but sometimes uh we wouldn't like the homes as ourselves as as the children um and i bounced around so many times different schools and it was a it was a hard time but at the end of the day that's all we had really pretty much was to you know have these random people bring us in their house and try to take care of us as best they could Uh, we all grew up so hard it was kind of hard to take care of us because we figured that they weren't our real parents, so it um it had no constitution to our family. So um, I, I don't think necessarily sixteen. I mean, I, that probably got lost around in there somewhere. It was probably about like twelve, twelve or thirteen. But that's still a lot of homes. But that's YouTube research's fault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that that's uh it got lost in the in the sauce somewhere. Uh, but did definitely did bounce around a lot of different homes and schools and. It kind of took a toll on me. Um, I was I was a um, a street runner pretty much. When I say street runner, I stayed in the streets. I was doing the stealing and all that other stuff, and it was kind of like a, 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 a definition of me. But then I've gotten the right people to, you know, sway me the opposite way, and uh, football became my uh, my savior, and um, got into God a lot, and it. Uh, it definitely changed my outlook on life, and I definitely decided to, you know, just take take the uh, the high road. Were the five of you always together throughout this whole journey? Not at all. Not at all. Um, they split. They split all three of my sisters up. Um, I have an older sister. I'm the second oldest out of five, um, and I have a younger brother and two other younger sisters. They put the two younger sisters together. They split. They took my older sister and put her somewhere and it was me and my brother for a while and then of course what brothers do we fight so they most families couldn't take that and they split us up now at what point do you get to atlanta is atlanta where you consider home at this point um yeah and no because um, i'm originally from sacramento california um atlanta I, I moved down there uh like i said i was back and forth um from um from california to atlanta um to the to my to the best of my knowledge um we uh I really got rel- well acquainted in Atlanta when I was uh, in high school. When I figured out, you know, that you know, I uh, wanted to play football. I didn't. I didn't play football my ninth grade year because I ended up missing that year, and I didn't start playing football until I was in the tenth grade. Um, I played a little pop Warner with one of the foster parents, Monique Gooden. She uh, she introduced me at. Believe it or not, I was a wide receiver. So, um, yeah, and that was and that was my main thing. Um, basically just believing that these these people that we don't know will steer us in the right track so i lived in atlanta lived in sacramento so so how do you find football is it that foster parent that originally introduces you to pop warner is it a high school coach that that recruits you because of your size maybe i mean you're obviously a, a linebacker now you're a big dude yeah um so like I said, I was a street runner, so I didn't really like football. Like, I didn't think that football, even when she introduced me to it, I 
kind of still didn't like it. Um, me being a receiver, we used to call that the okie doke position because they always had us running routes across the middle and linebackers, you know, deplete us. And I never liked the one getting hit. So uh, I would figure myself running around and hit people just because, you know, and uh, I just thought that, all right, I think I need to play defense. And um, she definitely, again, introduced me to that. Um, I ended up moving to defensive end and, uh, and linebacker, and um, I liked it a lot. At what point do you realize that football is something you have a gift for and have the potential to continue your education, continue playing after high school, maybe not make a living at it yet, but to take you somewhere? Um, so I played for um, – the school changed names uh, since I've been there, but it was Southside High School in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, my tenth grade year, my coach put me at defensive end, and I kind of and I kind of took off a little bit in it. I was the most aggressive one on our, on my defense, and um, Maurice Hart was my defensive line coach, and he pretty much took me in, and he started getting into my ear, telling me, "You can go somewhere with this. You just gotta stay out of the streets. This, this, and that." and basically being my, my guardian angel. And he told me that um, you can really go to college, you can go to the pros if you really invest in this in this game. And, you know, once it, once he told me that, it took me about a week and a half to, like, really, like, get that down packed. Like, to, and then season came and I just took off. And junior year came, senior year came, the college just started coming, and, and that's when it hit me. So, good segue, why Louisville? So <laughs> the story is um, I originally was a supposed I was committed. The very first school that came to me um, was South Carolina Gamecocks. And um, I committed instantly right there and then because I just, you know, I didn't know what to do. Like it was so many teams that were coming at me. So I just like, you know what, I'm just going to go with South Carolina. Went with them and uh, they ended up reneging right before uh, signing day. Reneged on a scholarship and um, – I was left. I was left out to dry. They ended up giving a scholarship to uh, Jadavion Clowney at the time, and um, I was left out to dry. And um, literally, like the next two days after that, I ended up taking a trip to Troy University. Troy uh, showed me mad love, and I was about to do it. And then, literally on my way back from uh, was I think it was before I went to Troy. I was on my way to Troy, and Charlie Strong called me on the phone, like literally him, himself. Head coach. Yeah, the head coach of Louisville. Hey, Malden, what are you doing? Uh, I said, I'm uh, I'm headed down to Troy. He's like, oh, what are you going down there for? And I'm like, uh, I'm going on a visit. I'm like, and I'm trying to figure out who this is. He's like, hey, this is Charlie Strong from the University of Louisville. And I looked at, and I, I forgot who I went down there with, and I looked at whoever I was driving with. Uh, it was my, my head coach, uh, Eric Williams. And, uh, I looked at him. I was like, "Oh, this is this is Louisville calling me." He's like, "Louisville," and we driving, and he's like, "Yo, so when you're done with that, come on down, come on down to Louisville." I was like, "Oh, we need to turn around. <laughs> <laughs> we need to turn around because uh, you know I think the Troy is a D1 AA. I'm not sure, and uh, they've got a good NFL pedigree too. Yeah, yeah, they do, they do. That's why, and that's why we were on our way down there because it's like, yo, they they have a good they have a good uh, stream of players that came out of Troy, so. Um, and went down to Louisville, fell in love with it, man. It was like the city itself, like, and I say it to this day, like, that's my second home. Like, I literally, I mean, they deemed me as a, a Kentucky colonel. So, like, I mean, that says a lot in itself. Um, and what Charlie Strong told me was uh, that that made me really commit to Louisville was, uh, he said, you will get your degree in three years. And that's what I did. At Louisville, you appeared in every game of your true freshman season. Then you started 6 of 11 in your sophomore year. Um, what were those first two years of college like for you, not only as a student athlete, but maybe as someone also seeking the stability of the home and family that a college campus and especially a football team provides? The first two years, um, my first year actually, um, I was like a kid in a candy store. Like I literally was able, a kid coming from foster care, being told what to do left and right. And, you know, what to wear or, you know, uh, what to eat. I'm by myself now. I'm uh, pretty much making my own decisions. And I felt I felt free. Like, I literally got into so much trouble, good trouble, mean, meaning like I was <laughs> doing whatever I wanted to do. College stuff. Yeah, college stuff. 
and uh, it felt good, man. And then you know, after a while, it, it, it put a tax on my body, and I'm just like, man, I, maybe I need to slow down and 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 get in and, and really get into why I'm really here, you know, to get my degree and to, to make it to the NFL. So I slowed down a little bit my sophomore year, and uh, the guys, the guys that um, that were graduating from the first year, I moved up the depth chart. So. And then after a while, I just started again. Like how I felt like in high school, I just started going off, and the coaches saw that. And and those those six games that I started, that was the, the towards the end of the season, and, and from there it was history. Now, before your last year, you switched from defensive end to linebacker, uh, which is where you're playing now. Although you're doing a, a mix of a little bit of everything at the spring league, uh, what went into that decision to make that move? So. Um, for the three years I was playing with Charlie Strong, um, Charlie Strong ended up leaving for um, we were we were a four three defense, and um, Charlie Strong ended up leaving uh, to go to Texas, and we ended up bringing in um, Todd Grantham. Todd Grantham was the defense coordinator. He brought in the three four, and we switched up and we switched over to from defensive ends to outside linebacker. So all of our DNs pretty much went to outside linebacker, and they were. They embedded in my head already in the league. You're not going to play defensive end because of your size or whatever. And I was like, maybe I gained a little weight. Maybe it's like, no, you should play. But then I started getting into the outside linebacker, and I'm thinking like, oh, this is easier because I can see the formations of offenses. I can see what they're about to do before they do it. I can get into uh, my pass rush easier because I'm standing up and I can see what the tackle is doing before. You know, I can I can read a lot of different things. So I've seen you at practice, you know, carving up O-linemen from a three-point stance. Um, outside linebackers are obviously standing most of the time. Do you feel more comfortable starting in a, in a two- or a three-point stance? I feel more comfortable in a three-point, I mean, because it's basically what I've been doing my entire life. Um, I believe that's why I got drafted, because I was rushing from a three-point. Um, uh, I say I say that because the only thing about the two-point stance, again, is it's easier to read things. It's easier to know what the play is about to be, you know, when you study film and everything, it's easier to uh, recognize the, the offense's scheme and be able to make a play whenever it needs to be made. Or, um, But defense, I feel like I have, um, when I'm on a three-point stance, I feel like I have more more power. I feel like I have more speed. Um, you know, when you're, in, when you're in track, you get down in a three-point stance or you get down or whatever, and you take off like that, that's how they get their speed. So... I feel like that's how I am, and if I'm at the certain, if I'm at the right weight, I mean, I feel like I can be unstoppable when it comes to speed. So, do you identify with one position or the other right now, or it's sort of whatever, whatever makes your prospects the best at this point? Yeah, whatever makes my prospect the best. Like, because at the end of the day, I can play both positions. It's just you know what scheme I'm 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 in. Like, uh, either I'm in a three four and I'm a, I'm a true outside linebacker, or if I'm in a four three and I'm a true defensive end. It depends on the scheme, and like right now, um, with the spring league, we're running a four-three defense. So I feel like I've, I'm more effective at four at, at a uh, defensive end uh, position than playing Sam and not coming at all, not rushing at all, but only dropping. You're one of the few, if not the only, guy here that was selected in in the draft. Um, so in 2015, the New York Jets took you in the third round, it's the 82nd overall pick, uh, which was the first year of the Todd Bowles era in New York. What's that moment like for you? I mean, how does that compare to maybe the Louisville offer, or is that totally different? Um, I probably would say that's like my second best thing that's ever happened to me in, in my in my entire life. My first was uh, actually graduating college. I was the first in my family to graduate college in three years. You did it in three. Yeah, I like, did it in three like years. Charlie yeah, said, I graduated in three years um, with a communications degree. Getting drafted, man. Like I. Didn't think I would cry, but I, I shed a lot of tears. I was on the phone with Charlie Strong. I mean, not Charlie Strong, but uh, uh, Todd. And I was on the phone with, uh, I got on the phone with Mike McCagney, and I got on the phone with Todd. And uh, we all, <laughs> we all heard it on the, on the, on the TV screen, me crying and everything on the phone and telling him I would give him everything I got, you know. So that, that feeling was I was with friends. I was with family. We all watched it on the TV when they called my name. And uh, when I got that call, man, I was I was like nervous eating. I was like I was stuffing my face with wings and chips and salsa. And then uh, my best friend Allison, 
uh, she sit next to me, one of my best friends. I, I call her my sister. Um, she's sitting next to me, and she's like, "Your phone's ringing," and I'm, I'm not even paying attention. I'm paying attention to the to the TV, and I'm eating. I'm eating, and then she's like, "Your phone ringing. It's from it's from uh, New Jersey," and I'm just like, "New Jersey? What team is in New Jersey?" And I'm like, "That's that's just probably like somebody trying to mess with me." But I'm thinking New York Jets. They're in New York, but now they everybody knows they play in New Jersey. But I answered the phone, fingers full of sauce and everything. I didn't care. Um, and it's Todd, and it's and it's uh, Mike McCagney on the phone, and I'm just like, "All right, this is it." And I and I almost fainted, literally. <laughs> and everybody caught me, and it, it it got real. They brought me a chair and just started talking. And, asked me what jersey i wanted and everything and it was just so much going on man it's it felt good it felt real good i finally and I, in my head i was like i made it your three seasons with the, three seasons with the jets are are marked by early on-field success and unfortunately injuries that ultimately ended your time there um in literally your first nfl game you had a strip sack of johnny manzel when he was with the browns uh, but then were subsequently carted off the field on that same play with a really scary looking injury um which is silly to say, but it was just a concussion. Mm -hmm. Um, In the end, though, even after a scary injury, you played 15 games in your rookie year, which included four sacks. So give us a sense of your first NFL impressions during your rookie year in New York, or New Jersey, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, So that first game, man, I had so much going on, man. Against the Browns, it was like I I get get, uh, migraines, they're hereditary. Uh, my mother, my mother caught them all the time, and I always caught them, but I never knew that they were migraines. I thought they were just random headaches, and uh, I had a migraine so bad that game, and uh, the, all the bright lights, they were like they were they were dog in my eyes. Like I was, you know, I felt sick and everything. And as soon as I heard them call my name, I was a third round pass rusher. I mean, a third down pass pass rusher, and uh, they called my name, and my eyes got big and. I was already having a migraine, so I go out, go out there, and I'm rushing. And next thing I know, uh, Johnny Manziel's running down the field, and, I, and I'm in my pursuit angle, and I go in to tackle him. That's the last thing I remember. And next thing I know, the next day, I'm in the hospital. I didn't wake up till the next day. Your second season with the Jets is to date your last in the NFL, but certainly not your last. You spent your third season on IR with a back injury and were released right before what would have been your fourth season. Um, so how do you sum up with your, your time with the Jets and, and your NFL experience so far in your young career? I feel like I was off to a great start. Um, I definitely knew that I was going to get better and better each day, um, each year. And um, I knew that I had a chance to be a, uh, eventually a starter for the Jets. Um, that was that was my goal going into year three. Um, I had a I had a, an injury my, my second year, uh, uh, an ankle injury to where I couldn't uh, finish the last five games. And I ended up going into my third year healthy and everything. And then, of course, my third year, um, I, f- I felt like, yo, I'm I'm ready. I'm, like, I'm doing my thing in, 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 uh, in OTAs, training camp and everything. And I'm hearing the, the, the potential, oh, he, he's, you know, he's the number one guy on our, on our outside linebacker list. And we go in, we get Kevin Green. Um, Kevin Green is, of course, the Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer coach that coached Clay Matthews and was over in Green Bay doing his thing. And he comes over and teaches us a lot of different new things. And um, one of his one of his uh, his teachings pretty much uh, gave me an edge, more of an edge as a pass rusher, and I felt good doing it. And um, that and that led to uh, me messing up my back. I had a herniated disc before that. But it never really bothered me until I went in for that contact with the tight end, and I went in and it pushed, kind of pushed my spine down, and it ended up pushing that disc out, and um, I had to get it shaved down and everything, and that pretty much defined why I was released from the Jets. Are you 100% healthy now? Definitely 100% now, and I feel good. Like I, I lost the weight that I had, that I was carrying at that time. Um, I feel like I'm down at my college weight. Um, I was 248 in college, and now I'm like 253, 254, so I feel fast. I feel lean, um, definitely still strong, and I just feel like I'm just flying around everywhere I go. 
And you mentioned earlier that you're you're training in New Jersey still. So are you still um, sort of around that that life and that world you lived while you were with the Jets, or, or still in contact with the team at all? Um, I'm not in I'm not in contact with the team. The only time when it comes to being in contact with the team is when I uh, when I need my medical stuff. Um, migraine medicines or anything, and I and I ask, you know, who do I talk to, doctor wise, you know, now that I'm with not with the team, um, you know, to get that stuff. But um, contract wise, anything, no, I'm not in contact with them or anything. They did just change coach and staff and everything, so um, I don't know any of the coaches there to talk to them and you know try and do anything. Um, I leave everything to my agent, and you know, um, like I said, I haven't heard anything from anybody. Uh, but and that's why I'm here, you know, just to prove, you know. Yeah, new staff though, so they could still be back and play for you. Yeah, st- still. Um, and, you know, you hear a lot of the draft talk, and you know, they're saying that they're bringing in and, uh, another outside linebacker at their. I don't know what pick they have in first round or whatever, but like I said, it's it's draft talk, and you never know what goes on when it comes to the draft. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's still possible. It's still possible. So to elaborate on something else you said earlier, um, you tweeted in March, uh, I understand as fans you guys only look for sacks from an outside linebacker, but it's more to the game of football. Coverage responsibility, QB disruption, setting edges in the run game, formation recognition, etc. Uh, so what are some of the things that don't show up on a stat sheet that you want people to know you excel at as an edge rusher? Um, you know, getting, getting like, I, like I said, QB disruption. Like um, my, my year, my what, second, third year, I can't remember, me and Leo were going back and forth. Leonard Williams were going back and forth at, you know, getting disruption on the quarterback. And we made it a little game. You know, it, we both were at 16 at one point. We started going more and more, getting quarterback hits and everything. You disrupt the quarterback, and he's the, he's the motor of the, of the offense. So if you disrupt him, they can't make a play. It's third down. They get him off on third down, we're good. Um, coverage responsibility. I'm not going to go forward all the time as an outside linebacker. We have to go into coverage most of the time. And a lot of guys don't, a lot of fans don't see that. Like, they just see that, oh, he's dropping in the coverage, so he's not in the play right now. So, and then the ball never gets thrown to your side. They're like, oh, where's Lorenzo Malden? Like, what is he doing? Like, is he is he not, is he not rushing his time? Is he, what is he doing? Like, if I'm not rushing or if I don't get an interception, that's kind of considered as, oh, he didn't do anything this game. The Spring League has a, a professional football league as a partner for the first time this year. Um, so the XFL has been on site uh, at all practices and uh, not only evaluating players, but also evaluating some rule changes that they're hoping to bring to the game of football. Um, be vague about this because I don't want to be the one breaking confidentiality yeah, yeah, yeah. in their rule stuff. But um, what have you seen about their rule changes that you might like or that seem seem different? Um, the thing about safety is is is, a, is the biggest thing when it comes to football. I understand that the the NFL is doing a whole thing about you know helmet to helmet contact and you know it it takes the fun out of the game. I guess you can say, but again, this is a game that doesn't have players last long. So the XFL definitely uh, is taking taking control of that, taking heed to the whole safety part of the game and. Um, when it comes to the kickoff purposes and when it comes to punt, um, a lot of guys are running down full speed. You got to remember these guys are big and these guys are fast, and that's it's the laws of physics that pretty much get in, get involved with football and you know blind side shots and all of this different stuff. It's 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 very detrimental to a player's uh, uh, standards when it comes to longevity in the league. So. Um, I feel like the XFL's rules are, are definitely going to help out when it comes to player safety. Now, last question, very hard-hitting question, and again, it came up in my YouTube research. Um, I might have seen a dancing clip or two of you from high school. <laughs> are you still finding some times to bust out moves? Uh, actually, um, <laughs> what's crazy is, you know, I, I heard people say that ballet and everything helps a, a player with stretch with with being limber with being uh flexible and everything i actually did ballet in high school and um got laughed at but that wasn't the yeah. video i saw yeah i yeah. saw him like a break yeah. dancing yeah yeah, yeah that was that's <laughs> so yeah i'm gonna get i'm gonna get into that 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 my teacher my ballet teacher in high school um 
she threw a ta- a teacher a teacher student dance or a t- talent show, and um, I ended up getting my math teacher, and uh, we uh, everybody else was doing things like salsa and you know floral dancing and everything, and I'm just like. I'm a hip hop dancer. Like that's what I do. Like I dance. I, I hip hop dance. Like I love just looking at it, and I love like trying to do everything that I saw. So um, I told her I was like, "You're gonna have to young up a little bit for me to to get this." Day. And we ended up winning this, the talent show. So it was it was fun. I was like, and I still do a little something. Something I pop and lock here and there, but nothing too crazy. I'm like, maybe if you I, run one back. Yeah, if I if, yeah, if I definitely get an inception, get a pick six, I I'd probably do a little a little something something. But so the lady in that dance video was your math teacher. Yeah, she was my math teacher. Yes. All right, good to know. Well, and then ending on a hard hitting note, wish you the best of luck. Uh, I'm super confident from what I've seen out there. Not that you know, I'm I'm just a photographer, podcast host. But uh, thanks for sitting down with me and taking the time. Pleasure's mine, Alex. Thank you for having me. All right, that will bring us to the end of our interview with Lorenzo Malden. I can't wait to find out where Lorenzo ends up after proving his health at the Spring League. A big congrats to Lozo and family as well on the birth of his baby less than a month ago. As a reminder, tickets for this weekend's game and the April 11th doubleheader are on sale now at thespringleague.com. You can follow the Spring League on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at the Spring League. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Alex Goldstick. All music was provided to the Spring Forward podcast by Joshua Rosner. We'll be in Austin for at least one more episode. Until next time, later. Later.